biggest problems of social organization. That is, how as a society do we make decisions? And this is going to be motivated by the public goods problems we talked about on Tuesday and the flaws that we saw of democratic voting from the last class. Um, in some sense, this is exactly the opposite of the problem of public private goods. So in private goods, we thought, oh, have a lot of competition that'll solve everything. Here, as the number of people gets large, things get worse. So the more society develops, the more pressing these types of problems are to solve. So um, I'm going to start by talking about the classical uh, social choice impossibility results. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the modern developments that try to think about least manipulable uh, systems for making social uh, decisions. I'll give a little bit of empirical evidence about these strategic concerns. Um, and I'll, I'll then talk about the sense in which representative democracy among sort of the standard options might be the best of the bad uh, options that are available. But I'll emphasize sort of as we talked a little bit about in the last class that the failure of that to take into account the intensity of different people's preferences is its biggest problem. And I'll talk about some of the both traditional and recent approaches to taking into account preference intensity. I'll then propose a solution, quadratic vote buying, um, and talk about some of the applications of that. Uh, I'll wrap up then by talking about other open problems in social choice theory and sort of wrap up the course with a little uh, uh, speech. Okay, so. The problem of voting uh, manifests it itself even more strongly when there are multiple choices. And this problem was first observed by Condorcet in 1785. So he imagined a case when there are three candidates, A, B, and C, and three voters. So imag imagine that one voter prefers candidate A, their second choice is candidate B, and their th third choice is candidate C. The second voter prefers candidate B, their second choice is candidate C, and their third choice is candidate A. And the third voter is can is prefers candidate C, second choice candidate A, third choice candidate B. Now, a natural question here is um, who should win this election? Who's a natural winner of this election? What do you think, Daiichi? Well, it's symmetric, so they, they get to make yeah, exactly. So uh, there's two votes for A over B. There's two votes for B over C. And there's two votes for C over A, right? And in fact, everyone is ranked number one one time, number two one time, and number three one time, right? On the other hand, it's not as if the election is an exact tie. Because in any pair, you always prefer one over the other, except it goes around in a cycle, right? Um, and this is called Condorcet's paradox of voting. Um, one reaction you could have to Condorcet's paradox of voting is that this is just a version of having a tie when there are three winners. But it turns out that that's not quite true either. So there's been many systems for voting that have been proposed to deal with this, and we'll talk about some of them later. Um, but Arrow in 1950 showed the fundamental limits of any system of ordinal voting. So he proposed some basic requirements that any system of voting should satisfy. Eric Guan, do you remember what those were? Um. So one of them is that like if everyone prefers candidate A to candidate B, then A will beat out B. Uh, yep, that's called Pareto efficiency. Uh, how many of these are three? Yeah, more or less. Um, there's a like symmetry or anonymity or whatever, where like each person's vote is like. The yeah, that's stronger than you need actually. Uh, but there's something like that which is called non-dictatorship. That it shouldn't be the case that regardless of what everyone else says, one guy always gets his way. 
Mm, not quite. It turns out to be sort of equivalent to monotonicity. But it means that if people increase their ranking of somebody, then that person's ranking in the social order has to increase. That like you can never go from one situation just by increasing the number of votes for you to um, from winning to losing. There, there's. Does anyone remember what arrows require, Jim? From IIA, like independent voting for the organizing. So yeah, what's that? So if you change, if everyone changes their ranking, but it doesn't change the relative ranking of two people, then the sort of social order, the relative ranking is exactly. Oh, and the, the last one is universal domain, which is that um, you should be able to give some answer for any ranking set of rankings that you get. So if all those are true, arrow showed that the only chose social choice rule, there was no social rule, choice rule satisfying all of those things, or the only one satisfying these three is dictatorship. Okay, so this provides a strong sense in which democracy is flawed. You might think, okay, well, let's have a runoff election. That'll make things better. Or let's have whatever. But no matter what system you have, you're going to run into these fundamental problems. Um, and Gibbard and Satterthwaite uh, extended this idea to show that any voting system is going to give people incentives to misreport their preferences. And they use that as a way to explain why you would have this uh, assumption of independence of irrelevant alternatives, which seems pretty reasonable, but it doesn't seem like it's absolutely necessary. I mean, if you add something else and you know that you know where in the ranking that is and it's in between two things, that might give you a sense that you should put more weight on the thing depending on where it is, but there's a sense in which you can't do that uh, because it gives people bad incentives. Um, uh, and they showed that you have to have independence of irrelevant alternatives if you want uh, this to be the case. And Dan, why, why is independence of irrelevant alternatives necessary to avoid having people manipulate this scheme? They can change sort of things that don't matter, but then that has a real effect on the outcome of the election, and that means it is in fact uh, manipulable. Yeah, exactly. So if I want, if I know that like A and B are the two people who have a realistic chance of winning, and you want me to truthfully report my preferences, you need to make sure that rearranging things other than A and B doesn't have any effect on that election, because otherwise. I'm going to put A at the very top and B at the very bottom, right? Uh, regardless of what else is going on, if I think those are the two people who have a realistic chance of winning the election, right? So uh, if you replace arrow IIA with the condition that no, everyone wants to truthfully report their, um, their preferences, then you get arrow's result as well. Um, so the literature has tried to um, uh, study this in a few different ways to try to get around this negative result. One is that they try to think, well, look, we know that if you can allow any, people to have any set of preferences, that things will have to be manipulable. So one thing you could ask is, if we have a limited set of preferences, what rules are most often manipulable? What rules are least often manipulable? Another question you could ask is, how much can you gain by manipulating on average? Right? Um, I think both of these pro approaches are a little bit flawed for reasons I'll highlight later, which basically have to do with the fact that I'm not sure the real problem has to do with manipulability. Because, for example, consider the plurality rule in an election. That is, that whoever gets the most votes uh, wins, regardless of whether they get a majority or not. Now that's clearly manipulable. You don't want to report as your hi highest preference who exactly you think is going to um, win, uh, who, who exactly you prefer most, right? You want to report of the candidates that you think is likely to get the highest or the second highest vote, which one you think you prefer. But is that such a bad thing, right? I mean, in the end, 
we want people to sort of think about that type of stuff, right? We don't want people to truthfully report their preferences to plurality rule, right? Um, a third approach is to incorporate the intensity of preference, and we'll talk a lot about that later. So I'm sort of going to go through these three different uh, approaches um, for the rest of the lecture. Okay, so one recent literature has focused on the least manipulable rules. And one of those uh, approaches is of Des, Desgupta and Maskin. So what they look at um, is what are the set of rules which have the maximum set of preferences such that if, you, um, if preferences are restricted to that set, you uh, don't have uh, any manipulation. Um, and the Condor say rule is one that's very, it, that, that satisfies that property. So what's the Condor say rule? This says that if there is a, what's called Condor say winner, that guy wins. So what's a Condor say winner? He's someone who would beat any other candidate if they were the only two people running by majority rule. Now there was no Condorcet winner in that Condorcet example, but if there was a Condorcet winner, it seems reasonable to say they should win, right? Turns out that if it's the case that people's preferences are such that a Condorcet winner exists, then the Condorcet rule is not manipulable. As long as you set what happens when there isn't uh, a Condorcet winner in a, some reasonable way. Now the question is, what reasonable way should you set the winner to be when there is no Condorcet winner? Well, it turns out that in cases where there are lots of cycles where there is no Condorcet winner, a system that's very non-manipulable in that case is the, what's called the board account. The board account is one where you rank your candidates and the top candidate you rank gets one point, the next candidate gets two points, and so forth. We then add up the number of points that people get across different people, and whoever gets the lowest number of points wins. So that's trying to sort of take into account intensity of preference based on where in the list you rank something. And you can see that when there's lots of cycles, that's sort of a case when anyone might win. When it's not the case that there's one, you know, two candidates that are really going to be the ones that are competing. And so in cases where there's cycles, that's not going to be very manipulable because you're not going to want to lie if you know that anybody might have a chance of winning. Right? So Borda does very well when Condorcet does poorly. And so a natural system is to have, to have the Condorcet guy win if the Condorcet, if there is a Condorcet winner, and otherwise to use the Borda rule. Now it turns out that that's not, that that can still be manipulable in the case when there's neither a Condorcet winner nor lots of cycles, but at least it limits the set of cases when those problems show up. So I think that's an interesting approach. A second approach that was uh, proposed by Gabriel Carroll, who was on the job market last year, was to think about when is it least often the case that people have an incentive to manipulate. And in particular, he asked what systems give the lowest probability of you having an opportunity to manipulate them. Now notice that the Borda rule, if you just randomly draw people's preferences in some way, is going to give you a very high opportunity to manipulate. Why is that? Well, there's almost always going to be some switch you could make somewhere down your line that would increase the probability of that switch thing mattering, right? Um, on the other hand, the plurality rule, he says, is much less manipulable because it's not that frequently that your top, you want to switch your top choice, right? But to me, that's a little bit of a silly statement to make because the border rule also gives you very strong incentives to tell the truth. Because you, everything you say matters, right? So it gives you incentives to manipulate for that reason. It also gives you incentives to tell the truth for that reason. Whereas plurality, nothing below your top choice matters. 
right? And so while you don't have an incentive to manipulate anything below your top choice, you don't have an incentive to tell the truth either, right? Um, so it's not really obvious to me that the amount of manipulation would go down by using one of these systems that least frequently gives you an incentive to manipulate in any way, because those might also give you very little incentive to tell the truth. OK. So I think voting is obviously very deeply flawed, but a question is, can we do better? And Bierbrower and Helwig give a very pessimistic answer to this case, to this question. And let's return to the case when there's just two alternatives for this. The question is, is there any rule that we could use that incorporates intensity of preferences? Now, we know that the VCG rule incorporates intensity of preferences, right? But we also know that it's very subject to collusion. So Bierbrower and Helwig asked that voting rules that they consider have two requirements. And Eric, what were the two requirements that Bierbrower and Helwig asked for? In some sense, that captures both, because he said that no individual should be able to manipulate it and no group should be able to manipulate it, right? So no group, including an individual, should be able to manipulate it in any way, right? Turns out that if there's a large number of people and that's the case, then the only system is voting that, that satisfies this property. Um, and the basic intuition behind that is any time your intensity of preference matters in a large group of people, there's going to be something like the, uh, a VCG type of manipulation in principle. Okay. Um, now, that, that's a very strong requirement. That says that no group has any incentive to manipulate in any way at all. You can think of weaker restrictions you put on collusion. The problem with VCG was that collusion was super easy and incredibly strong. So we might think this is too strong, and, and we'll sort of come back to this. It also might be too strong to require that everything be strategy proof, that you want to tell the truth about your preference despite anything that anyone else says, right? You might instead want to have a system more like the first price auction, where what you want to do depends on how other people behave. Um, but uh, this gives one sense in which Churchill's quote uh, is, is correct. Churchill famously said that democracy was the worst of all systems except for every other one that had ever been tried, right? Uh, and, and this is a sense in which voting uh, is the only really feasible system. Okay. So um, the, uh, the problem that we're running into is that there's lots of ways to m manipulate in these voting situations. And one of the most famous ways of man manipulating voting situations uh, is exactly what um, I was describing before, Mohammed. If we have plurality voting, what is the most simple, natural way that you want to manipulate that system? Uh, so in plurality, the top choice is what's important. So like, even if like, uh, you're in the most important people are into your top choice, you want to like, put the one that you prefer on top of your list. And what's a real world example of that? Say like in the United States. But, but is that manipulation something bad? Because if no, it's not. It's yeah. not necessarily. I, I, I have a say and yeah. No, that's that's true. But but like, what would be an example of that in the United States? Uh, like the Al Gore election. Yeah, people were probably stupid to vote for Ralph Nader, right? Because he had no chance of winning, and they ended up tipping the election to Bush, right? Um, okay. So this leads to one of the most famous theoretical claims in voting theory, which which about empirical uh, reality, which is that called Duverger's law, that says that in plurality rule, the number of voting for the third place candidate is going to be much smaller than in a system that allows for runoffs. Right. Um, now, notice that the reasoning in Gabriel Carroll's paper, right, was that we want to give people not too much of an incentive to manipulate. Because if they don't have a large incentive to manipulate, then they're just going to tell the truth. 
And you might think that Duverger's law, law would be wrong if that claim in Carroll's paper was right, right? Because then, as long as the election's big, people don't have much of an incentive to manipulate. If they're just reporting their preferences truthfully, conditional on voting, right? Then they're going to report their thing regardless of whether it's plurality or, uh, or um, runoff. And Fujiwara in 2011 uh, came up with a really nice test of this. So what he did is he used the fact that different areas of Brazil have different numbers of inhabitants, but that in municipalities with more than 200,000 people, they use a runoff rule. With less than 200,000 people, they use plurality rule. And so he was able to do a regression discontinuity where he looked at places just below and just above 200,000 and look at how many votes were gotten by the third place candidate, right? And he finds strong evidence for Duverger's law, um, in particular, that um, uh, if you look, this is the share of the vote gotten by the third place candidate. You see how much lower it is just below 200,000 voters than just above, right? Now, I think what this tells us is that the problem is really not about people manipulating the system. It's actually fine for people to manipulate the system as in this. The problem is that voting doesn't incorporate intensity of preferences. So um, let's try to uh, think about what we can do about that. OK. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Mohammed. If the voting was like instantaneous and there was no process, then he, like, he, your statement was true. But because the voting is a process, if I have like higher intensity, it's not only my vote, but I go and talk to lots of people, I call people, and I like, I turn in like hundreds of people to vote that weren't going to vote. So like my intensity is... Yeah, so that probably imperfectly incorporates the intensity of the preference. It certainly isn't going to do it perfectly, and there's certainly going to be ways to manipulate it that are not going to be ideal. But, uh, but you're right. I think there are features of the system that help to offset uh, the, these problems. So like, for example, and after Obama, like the Tea Party was very angry. They turned out a lot of votes. And like, well, yeah, and when I, you know, when I was on a recruiting committee, uh, if I cared a lot about a candidate, I put in a lot of time, and as a result, I was able to move a lot of people's opinions. And other people who didn't care very much didn't put in much time and didn't move people's opinions much. So I think that there's, there's some truth to that. But I also think that it's, it's certainly not perfect and that the imperfections of the formal system are only partly offset by the uh, approaches that people have to dealing with those imperfections. Okay. Another problem that comes in voting is that basically people don't have any incentive to think about who to vote for. Why is that? Well, their vote makes very little difference, right? Um, because they are such a small part of the whole electorate. And that might lead, um, and how mu much their intensity is of their preference doesn't matter at all. So they just don't reflect on it at all, and they just go and vote, right? Um, and so I think that that means that if you know, there's anything that requires any careful thought, voting is not going to be a very good way to deal with that. So I think that means that to the extent possible, we should avoid social choice unless it's absolutely necessary. And whenever possible, rely on some form of expertise. But we know that social choice is necessary when there's really diffuse information. And so the question is, what is the system of government that combines expertise whenever possible, but when absolutely necessary, uh, some form of voting. Can anyone think? Yeah, Chrissy. Representative democracy, Representative democracy right? Um, so, so with a strong executive, right? And this is, in many ways, the most overwhelmingly the most popular form of government in the world. So I think economics and sort of some of the logic of different mechanisms provides us with a national rationale for why we observe the forms of government we observe in the world. Unfortunately, it's still a little bit disappointing that economics doesn't give us much insight about how we can do better than existing forms of government. To do this, we'd have to have some clever way of incorporating intensity of preferences. And to me, that's the major outstanding question in social choice theory. Um, and I'm working on a proposal for this myself that I'll share with you in just a minute. 
But first, let's go back over ways of incorporating intensity of preferences, right? So one natural way is the VCG mechanism, right? Or the expected externality mechanism. Um, now, uh, can anyone uh, tell me what the fundamental flaws with both of these systems are? Yeah, Prashant. Uh, well, for the expected externality, like, uh, there's, there's an information problem. Yeah. Uh, the organizers, the both people in charge, need to know the distribution of people's preferences. Yeah. For VCG, I think uh, uh, there are problems with like people on like the very end of the distribution or something. That like two people who are very uh, far off values can use Yeah, exactly. So the VCG had the problem that it could run a budget surplus that you had to destroy, right? And that the inefficiency created by that could be just as bad. As the, or if not worse than the inefficiency created by not incorporating intensity of preferences. And more importantly, it causes terrible collusion problems because any two individuals can report a very extreme preference, pay nothing, and get their desired outcome. Okay. And in fact, that's actually an equilibrium. And that's sort of the reasoning behind the Beer Brower Helwig result. On the other hand, the expected externality mechanism is not strategy proof, but maybe that's okay given that it solves the other problems of VCG. But the problem is, how do you know what the expected externalities are, right? As a result, neither of these really seems practi practical. And so people have proposed some other approaches. So one approach, one set of approaches, works only if we have many decisions that we need to make as a society. Um, so uh, in that case, um, there are some interesting mechanisms, but I think both of them have some significant problems. So one that I think is very interesting was proposed by Alessandra Cassell in 2005, and she had the idea that you could have storable votes. So you would have a certain number of votes for your life, and you could use them as you wished on different elections. So this forces you to make trade-offs about which issues you care most about. Unfortunately, it's not clear that this system is efficient or even that it's better than the other system. And the reason is individuals would have an incentive to use all their votes on the one issue that they care the most about and none on any others. So rather than taking into account everyone's preference sort of in proportion to how much they care, we would take into account only the set of people who that's their issue that they care the most about, right? Um, and in, with a large enough set of issues, this is actually basically a dictatorship of the people who care the most, which is likely even worse. Uh, and in fact, you have to sort of explore that a little bit on your problem set. A second mechanism was proposed by Jackson and Sonnenschein, and it's called the linking mechanism. And Carl, why don't you explain that, given that you, uh, you obviously read the paper? Uh, so they asked people to report their types, and then based on their reports, they, uh, in later mechanisms, like in, they treat the reports as truth, and you have to be consistent across. So your decisions in one affect your decision, or the outcome of the other. Yeah, so basically the idea is that if we know the distribution of what cardinal values people might have, then we can give them tokens corresponding to every cardinal value they could have, right? And then we use the knowledge that we have of the distribution of types to keep people honest, right? And then the law of large numbers means that we converge uh, to the optimal, uh, the law of large numbers means that the number of times that someone actually gets that type is equal to the distribution, right? Uh, and therefore, the number of tokens can be set such that everything works out. Now, that requires, in some ways, even stronger knowledge of the distribution than the expected externality mechanism requires. So it sort of has the same problem. So I think both of these are very interesting, but this one is not clearly an improvement, and this one is totally impractical. So um, that is where the literature stood when I started working on this quadratic vote buying mechanism. And I was pretty dissatisfied with all these directions. So um, I stumbled, and in the process, I stumbled upon a very simple rule. So imagine that every individual gets, we're making a binary decision. Every individual gets a utility UI from us as a society taking the decision in one direction versus the other. Let's say 
A is the positive, you get positive utility. Uh, if you have positive utility, that means you prefer A. If you have negative utility, that means you prefer B. And imagine these are drawn into independently and identically across people from some distribution that has mean mu and variance sigma squared. What, can anyone describe to me what the quadratic vote buying mechanism is? Uh, Eric? Um, so you buy a certain number of votes, but the number of votes, like the cost of buying n votes is proportional to n squared. Yeah. Um, with the idea that the marginal cost of a vote is, is linearly increasing. Yeah, exactly. So each individual chooses how many votes vi to buy. Those can either be positive in favor of A or negative in favor of B. Um, the decision is made based on the sum of the votes, so that's majority rules and purchased votes. And you can buy any continuous number of votes you want from a centralized clearinghouse. And then the payments that you make are you have to pay for all the votes that you buy, and then you get back some share of the sum of the votes that everybody else buys. So you're paying the square of the number of votes, um, and then you're redistributing back the resources in some way. One natural way would be to just give people a share that's equal to 1 over n. And notice that this um, is, avoids two of the problems of both expected externality and VCG right up front. First of all, it's clearly budget balanced because we refund all the revenue. And second, um, it doesn't have uh, it doesn't depend in any way on the rules. Uh, sorry, on the distributions. It's just a fixed set of rules, right? Simple fixed set of rules. Yeah, Mohammed. Well, like, uh, doesn't, isn't it flawed? Because, like, uh, 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 for example, 100, like, uh, very, very wealthy people can, like, buy most of the votes. And We're going to go through the analysis in just one second. Well, not exactly. Um, let's. So the, the key thing is that the amount you pay is proportional to the square of the number of votes you buy. Right? And so that's going to make the votes increasingly expensive the more that you buy. Why is there like extremely wealthy like compared to the rest of us? Well, if we have a if we're trying to maximize look, we want the wealthy to have more influence in some sense, right? Because if we want to maximize total efficiency, right? The wealthy are going to care more about things usually than other people do in dollar terms. So if we're trying to maximize total willingness to pay, yeah, right? Like yeah, so I mean, but if you don't want to maximize total willingness to pay, you could still do this by, say, doing Casella's thing, but then charging the number of tokens that you have to pay to buy a number of votes in any given election would be proportional to the square. So then everyone would have equal influence, but you would still get conditional on votes Pareto optimality. But I don't see why v votes are that different than any other area where we have inequality, right? I mean, there's a lot of people that would rather have a, a home to live in and no influence on politics than have influence on politics and be starving on the street, right? And this system, by redistributing money back to people, might actually be preferred by many of the poor. Uh, in fact, your problem set will have you look a little bit at that. Um, OK. so. Um, the uh, basic argument of why this makes sense can be seen by imagining that the, let's let G, capital G, be the um, CDF of the distribution of the sum of any n minus 1 people's votes. And let's let little g be the density function associated with that. And this is going to be symmetric across people as long as people have symmetric strategies and have IID valuation draws, right? OK. So, Rushang, what is going to be, if I have a utility UI, my expected utility as a function of the number of votes that I buy? Um, so, you have utility UI, and then do you subtract the amount that you well, utility UI is contingent on the outcome being A, right? And I get zero utility if the outcome is B. Okay, right? So it's just the probability of the influence in the election, or like of A winning times. Yeah, so what's that probability? If the distribution of the sum of all the other votes is G, capital G, what would be the probability of A being chosen if I buy a number of votes of EI? Uh, just the, the little G EI. 
Well, that would be the chance that B wins, right? Because that's one the ch minus, yeah. One minus yeah, exactly. G of negative V i, right? Because my votes make it less likely. Yeah. Um, and, then and that's times u i, right? Yeah, that's times u i, and then you have to divide it two because the possibility of the other. No, you're getting into the marginal thing, but but that, that that's right. And then you have to subtract off how much you pay, right? right? So your expected utility is 1 minus capital G of negative VI multiplied by UI minus the square. And then you get some refund back, but that doesn't depend on how many votes you buy. So let's just drop that out. That's a constant from your perspective. OK. So Chrissy, what then is the marginal benefit you get from buying an additional vote? Little g of minus vi times ur. Um, exactly. So it's the marginal benefit and the marginal cost is 2 vi. Yes, that's right. So we have to equate those two things to each other, right? To f solve for the optimal number of votes. And we get the optimal number of votes to buy is equal to your utility multiplied by g of negative vi over 2. What is g of negative vi? Does anyone want to interpret that? Well, that's sort of the, yeah, Neil. Is it like the amount, of, the amount of people that care as much as you do in the other direction? No, not quite. Does anyone else? It's basically like, what's the chance of the election being exactly tied, right, if you buy that number of votes? So that chance of the election being exactly tied, I think, I want to argue, should basically be independent of the number of votes you've already bought and of who you are. Why is that? Well, basically, the distribution is locally uniform. The way to think about that is, you know, if I bought 400 votes in favor of Gore, then um, the case when the election exactly tied is Bush was otherwise winning by 400 votes. If I buy 400 votes in favor of Bush, then the chance that the election exactly tied is that otherwise it was 400 votes in favor of Gore. But if you think about it, those are like, from my perspective, exactly the same event, right? The difference between Bush winning by 400 votes and Gore winning by 400 votes is like hanging chads, right? There's like, those are just both the event, the election is basically tied, right? Um, and so in a large election, it has to be the case that this G function is basically the same for all people and is basically constant over the range of votes that anyone's going to buy. I won't bore you with the proof of that, but it sort of ma stands to reason, right? Because it's an aggregate event that the election's tied. It doesn't depend on you as an individual. So we can approximate this g by just a constant g0. And so what that means is everyone's going to buy a number of votes, which is proportional to their utility, right? And that means that the sum of the votes is, has the same sign as the sum of the utilities, which gives us optimality. Right? Because everyone buys votes that are proportional to their utility. This is basically the virtue of having the rule be that you pay the square of the number of votes. And your problem set is going to have you look at that. OK. Now, Carl, what are the incentives for collusion under this mechanism? Uh. Imagine that you, you had a group of people. Like, if you have a group of people, the cost isn't going up quadratically. Yeah. So, like, yeah. Well, it's still going up quadratically. Well, for the group, but not the yeah. Yeah. So basically, I want to claim that this is not too sensitive to collusion. And to do that, let's imagine that there's a group of people m of size little m, right? Um, and let's assume that everyone's getting back 1 over n of the revenue. So if we then let g to the n minus m be the distribution of the sum of n minus m people's votes, what is going to be the expected utility of the entire group added together? Right? Because the group, if you're a collusive group, you act to maximize the sum of everyone's utilities. What's the utility of the whole group? added together. Can anyone? Rashawn? 
So would it be the utility, uh, the sum of the utility of like each individual time? Yes. The entire uh, times. So you also want to subtract one minus g and minus m power, or like you want you want yeah. the converse. Yeah. Uh, and then you just multiply that. that would be the yeah. And then you have to subtract off what? Yeah, exactly. So it's going to be, the just as Prashank said, the sum of the utilities multiplied by 1 minus g to the n minus m of negative the sum of the votes rather than the individual votes, right? Um, um, minus the amount that you pay, which is the sum of the square of the votes bought times 1 minus the fraction of that that gets refunded to people in the group. Right? OK. So um, notice, first of all, that you're always going to minimize this thing by having everyone within the group, whatever they do, all by the same number of votes. Can anyone explain why that's the case? Eric? Uh, because, well, a simple example, if you have two people and you want to buy four votes total, right, then if you do a 3-1 split, you have to pay a total of 9 plus 1, which is 10. If you do a 2-2 two -two split, you only have to pay 4 plus 4. Yeah, the reason is that, uh, is that the square function is convex, right, and therefore by Jensen's inequality, it's better to have the a everyone by the average than to have some variability, right? Okay, so if everyone buys the same number of votes V sub capital M, uh, sorry, if everyone buys votes, which are the total votes that the group buys divided by m, which is everyone doing the average, then what is going to be the expected utility of the group? How do we simplify this expression up there? Uh, Mike? Uh, simplifying the, the expected utility up there. Yeah, so if we, if we now have that everyone buys the same number of votes within the group, what, how does this, that simplify this expression? I mean, you just plug in VM over little m, or I guess VI, yeah. as we find it. Yeah. And for uh, V squares. Yeah. Sub m. Yeah. So how, how is that? Well, OK, so V squared sub m, that's the sum over m, the m people of how many votes in each one of them individually is buying. So yeah, so I'm denoting by capital M, the value, the value of something summed over all the people in the group. So what is going to be the value of this, uh, of the sum of the squares of the votes that people buy if everyone's buying votes like this? Well, well they all buy the same amount, right? Which is this. What's the square of this? The yeah, m squared. m squared, right? And then we add that up over m people, and what do we get? We get the m squared over m. Exactly. So this is people's uh, utility, right? So basically, this group is going to behave just like an individual, except that they're going to act as if they have this coefficient reducing the cost of buying votes for them, which is equal to this thing divided by m, which, as long as m is not very large relative to n, is basically uh, um, is basically the same as uh, m times u sub m, right? So basically, this m over two times u sub m. So basically, this group is going to buy um, a number of votes, which is. Uh, proportional to the uh, the number of people in the group more than they would buy individually, right? So each person in the group buys as if they had the entire group's utility, and that means that the entire group buys m times as much as they would buy as an individual, right? And so what that means is two things. So first of all, people are not going to have very strong incentives to collude in the following sense. Remember that in VCG, any two individuals could totally mess everything up. Here, 
people mess stuff up only in proportion to how big their group is. So if the group is really small relative to the total society, it doesn't make that much difference that people are colluding. Right? So if two people are in the group, then they're going to have twice as much influence as they should, but that's not so bad. Right? Second, notice that the amount that you pay is um, proportional to the square of the number of votes you buy. Right? Now in VCG, we said that when those two people buy a like uh, report a very extreme utility, not only do they get what they want, but they pay nothing for it. They have no incentive to deviate from that agreement. Right? On the other hand, here, people definitely have an incentive to deviate. Right? If they're buying a number of votes that's very different than their own utility, they're paying up the nose for that. Right? Or if they're buying less, then it's worth it to them to buy more. Right? And in fact, that grows as the square of the difference. Right? And so if there's a lot of people colluding, if they're doing something very different than the unilateral incentives, they're going to have a big incentive to deviate from that, which is very much like what we said was true in Cournot, right? So the incentives here are much more similar to Cournot. The more you collude, in order to be effective colluding, you need a big group. But the bigger the group is, the more that you're deviating from what you would do unilaterally, the more incentives you have to deviate. Yeah, go ahead, Mohammed. I'm just going to say that the result of this election is very dependent on the, like, how much we are pricing to the first vote. And no, it's not. It's not? No, because it's, everything just gets scaled up and down by the, dent, the probability that the election is exactly tied. That adjusts in equilibrium so that everyone, so that the market clears perfectly. So people don't know the price beforehand? They're buying it? Or like no, the price is always just the square in dollars of the a number of votes they buy. But the thing is that people buy, OK, imagine that people start buying a lot of votes, right? Then what happens is that the chance that your pivotal goes down. If nobody's buying votes, the chance that your pivotal goes up. And so the effective value of a vote is proportional to the chance that the election's exactly tied, which is inversely proportional to how many votes people are buying. Maybe I'm missing the timing. Like people go up and buy the votes together, and they don't know uh, the proportion. Exactly. They, well, it, but they should know the price because they're deciding how much. Well, it's an it's an equilibrium phenomenon. You see what I mean? It's like at the equilibrium, everyone anticipates how many votes the other people are going to be vying, and therefore, as long as those beliefs they have about the chance that the election is exactly tied are the same across people. So we're giving it time? Like it's not a, a spontaneous? Thing. No, it is simultaneous, but it's just Nash equilibrium, right? Everyone has to guess what the equilibrium is going to be, right? So I mean, how many votes they want to buy numeri numerically is going to be proportional to uh, how mu much their utility is, but it will also be proportional to how many votes or inversely proportional to the fourth root of the how many votes they think other people will buy. It's like other markets, but this is not like other markets if I'm just guessing and buying something and then I have to price 10 times the what I've guessed. Because I can't guess in equilibrium. Like equilibrium is after people have guessed. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, that's sort of like a first price auction, right? In a first price auction, I have to guess what the market clearing price is going to be. So it's very similar to that. Um, okay, so Jim, why does this system work w uniquely? What, how is this related to the mechanisms we talked about earlier? Well, you have basically, well, how is it related to like the Yeah, so yeah, and VCG and the expected externality mechanism. We, sh we talked about the fact that those were the only mechanisms that could work. So in what sense does this work? How is it related to them? Um, you're, because basically people are internalizing their externality because they're paying and it's being refunded to everyone else. So you But why is the square the right thing for the externality? Because the marginal cost is the marginal cost of an extra vote is constant. Like the marginal impact on the. Well, the marginal cost of an extra vote isn't constant, it's increasing. 
the marginal, I mean, the marginal impact on the election of an extra vote. Well, because let's think. Well, but the question is, what's the externality you're imposing on other people? When I buy my first vote, what's the externality I impose? You on average. Well, because everybody else was basically indifferent to whether the election went this way or that way. Right. On the other hand, if people feel 100 votes in the opposite direction for me, then the marginal externality I impose is getting bigger. Right. So that's the reason why the, it should be linear, right? Because the more votes in the other direction everyone else is, the more I should have to pay to influence the chance of the election, one more unit in that direction, right? And so you're paying your expected externality. It's very similar to the fact that when we were studying, um, that when we were studying uh, externalities, that we know that there's a Harberger triangle, right? If I move the thing, if I move the quantity further and further away, my, the amount I pay grows as the square, right? Because initially people don't care about moving it, right? And then as I move it further and further, people care more and more. Right? And so it's the exact same logic as the Harberger Triangle. Right? Um, and in fact, it's the exact same logic that we went through when we talked about um, when, when in your problem set you derived the stuff about optimal um, pricing in financial markets. Right? The value to you privately was only proportional to the linear price difference. But the value to society was proportional to the squared price difference, right? And because it was this big aggregate social thing, you wanted to make everything proportional to the square, right? So the logic is exactly the same as there, right? Um, so obviously, as Mohammed was pointing out, this is not particularly straightforward for people to participate in, right? They need to anticipate what the equilibrium number of votes other people buy. But the same thing is true of the first price auction. And I think. A lot of the advantages and disadvantages of the first price auction apply to this context. It's not as sensitive to collusion, just as the first price auction is not as sensitive to collusion. And it's not, um, and it's not, uh, and it's uh, also harder for people to participate, just as the first price auction is a little bit more complicated than the second price auction, right? Um, and while I know that this might seem a little bit strange, I actually think that it's very similar to what we have in, in practice in many settings. In fact, Mohammed, you were talking about how people can incorporate their intensity, but probably the more you try to have an influence on the election, the harder it becomes. The less people you know to influence, the more pissed off people are that you're trying to influence a decision, et cetera, et cetera. Right? It's very easy to push a lot of decisions just over the edge, but if you try to push one from being, we're definitely not going to do it to we're going to do it, that costs you a lot of capital, right? Um, I know that from my experience in departments, right? Um, and basically what this mechanism does is it takes that informal logic that I think works very efficiently in many committee settings, and it gives us a formal way to apply it in anonymous settings, right? When there are a large number of people. Okay. Um, so Daiichi, where, where can you imagine applying this idea? Oh, so you just mentioned like committees. So if you were talking about like which candidate to pass or which candidate to admit your program, yeah. somewhere. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, one possibility was, you know, we talked about these holdout situations, right? And that you needed some way to vote on whether to accept an offer from the outside, right? That was efficient. That's a natural thing to do this. So on the FCC, if you before, you know, now they've just reallocated people across to different parts of the spectrum, so it's not a problem. But imagine we still had that basic FCC problem. Then you could have people vote using the system on whether to accept an offer for their spectrum. Right? Or for other holdout type things, like land assembly. Um, Eric Posner and I have been thinking about the idea of using this for debt settlements or for corporate governance, right? There you have big problems because people can sort of buy the right to vote on those situations right now in a linear way, but your problem set will have you explore why that's not such a good thing. 
but you can sort of imagine that's maybe not the best way for these things to run. So one way you could do it is you could delink the shares to a company from the right to vote and just let people vote uh, in this quadratic way on, um, on issues in governing the company. Um, other private groups like condo associations or con committees, uh, the EU could do something like this, right? If they want to vote among their different member con countries or Congress. Imagine that you could put up money going to your district or like allow your district's taxes to be raised or something like that and pay in that quadratically to have influence on a big piece of legislation. Um, eventually, maybe you could even do this in public voting or elections, maybe in a version with no money like the Casella storable votes thing, where you just get things to allocate over time. Okay. Well, so does this solve the pure problem of social choice? I'll leave you guys to judge what you think of the proposal. Um, but even if it does, I think there's still a lot of open quest interesting open questions. So one is continuous public uh, goods choices, right? This, my system might work for binary choices, but what about with continuous systems? Well, we know that you're going to have to have a Harburger triangle there, and therefore it's going to have to be quadratic. But how do you, in, in exactly what language do you report uh, exactly how much I feel in one direction or the other? It's not obvious that there's a simple way to do that. The other thing is that my mechanism um, is the limit of the expected externality mechanism as markets become very, very complementary, as there's lots of public goods, there's lots of people who all depend on one issue, right? On the other hand, we had a limit when things got to be very private goods, right? When there were lots of people competing for any one thing, the market, the free market economy or whatever, that was the mechanism that worked in that context. So those are two different limits, right, which give us two different solutions. But you can think of cases that are in between these where you might also be able to take limits. Like there are some substitutability in some ways, some complementarity in other ways. What if we take a limit in that case? What do we get then? So you could think that there, this is a broader approach that you could take to deriving optimal solutions for different contexts. Um, another issue is that when there aren't an infinite number of people, when there aren't a very large number of people, there might be adjustments you want to make to this system. Um, so, for example, as I start buying more votes, the chance that things are going to be exactly tied is probably going to be declining. Why is that? Well, the first number of votes that I buy, if, if, if I imagine the election is very close to being tied, once I've already bought some votes, then it's, the election is getting less likely to be tied, right? And so you might want to make some adjustment for that in terms of the rule. Okay, so um, let me just wrap up the class now. So this, uh, the goal of this course, I think, was to try to show you how thinking like an economist, how using economic reasoning to approach a lot of different problems changes the way you think about different social problems, right? And as a result, it was a back and forth between what we talked about in the beginning of class, paradigms, languages for thinking about things, and applications. Because the point was to get you thinking about the language of economics, but to do that by thinking about how it changes how you think about real world problems. And let me try to remind you of some of the breadth of questions we covered. We talked about occupational licensure. We talked on the, about the impact of uh, transportation and trade on development. We talked about mechanisms for allocating students to courses, about how to optimally tax or regulate carbon, about the regulation of the insurance industry, about the design of auctions and of criminal justice and how those were related to each other, about innovation policy and how we should reward innovations, about how to control mergers, about income taxation and optimal income taxation, about rules for making social decisions. And I hope that as a result of this, you are now something of an economic expert. You have a much more detailed way of thinking about all these issues that people in the general public might not have. Um, we also explored some fundamental trade-offs. Um, and I tried to provide a more nuanced, hopefully, 
and less ideological way of thinking about some of these trade-offs than you usually see in the media. Rather than just thinking about socialism or capitalism, government or no government, we tried to think about what were the particular informational issues that made different modes of social organization useful in different contexts. And I want to review some of those. So one role that the government has, we said, was to internalize externalities or to solve, and to solve problems of public goods and bads. And the basic trade-off we came to there was that there's a distortion, obviously, from ignoring those sorts of externalities. But on the other hand, it's very hard through the political process, given the problems of voting and social decision making, to incorporate that information uh, into the decisions that people make, because we don't have great mechanisms for doing that. We talked about redistributing income and providing social insurance. And there we learned about the trade-off between insurance on the one hand, which is beneficial because it gets money to people who have a higher marginal utility of wealth, versus reducing the incentives of people to earn income. We talked about regulation of uh, industries and the informational problems that run into, or prizes as an alternative to patents and the informational problems that runs into. And the trade-off between market power on the one hand and the static distortions that has versus the dynamic benefits from uh, entrepreneurship and encouraging innovation. We talked about competition policy and how that can reduce static distortions, but also reduces some economies of scale and may interact with creative destruction. Right? So these issues of socialism versus capitalism are really issues of, in particular different areas, what are the relevant information? Who is it held by? And based on who holds what information, what social organization is appropriate to each issue. Um, and so I hope that by doing this, I've, um, I've helped you guys to combine in yourselves the role of the expert in our models, right? That you get delegated to and the role of the voter, right? Because you guys are all going to have to make decisions about how our society operates, right? And by having both of those things together, uh, you can help solve some of these social pro choice problems we have because you're going to be able to make more intelligent decisions um, and, and be one of these people out in the public who's making choices about things, right? And so I think this brings us to sort of the end and to what this whole course means to you. And um, uh, the way I think about it, comes from an experience that I had that led me to be an economist. So back in the summer of 2005, at the sort of height of the credit boom, I worked for a hedge fund. Um, and we developed a trading strategy that arbitraged between two different markets. And basically, on the two sides of these markets were consumers, in some sense, who didn't really know what they were buying into or who use some heuristic to evaluate the transactions they were doing and therefore ended up buying various derivative securities that didn't make any sense for them to be buying. Right? And what we did is we arbitraged between those two markets. Um, and that made us a lot of money because consumers were confused in this market so they were overvaluing the asset. They were confused in this market so they were undervaluing the asset. We made an, a market between those. And what did that do? Well, it meant we made a lot of money. The price was low here. The price was high here. We made money off of that. And I went to my boss and I asked him, you know, what was the social value of us doing that? And he said, we supplied liquidity to the markets. And I said, you supplied liquidity to the markets. By that, do you mean that there are more consumers who now have the privilege of holding AAA rated toxic waste in this market? And there's a bunch of European consumers over here who now have the privilege of being levered up on the correlation in the market. And he said, look, ours is not to question why. Ours is just to do and die. Um, and that night, uh, I went to dinner with the man who became my advisor, Jose Shankman, who, became, who was originally a professor here. And he said, look, the benefit of being an economist is that, that if you're an economist, your job is to question why. right?" And that's why I decided to become an economist. And I think that that really summarizes to me what's so beautiful about the profession. The truth is that most people 
have enough to worry about in their daily lives that they don't have time to worry about this stuff, about how we organize society, right? Um, they have to worry about paying the bills, and that's how it should be, right? We shouldn't invest all our resources, we would say as economists, as society, in just reflecting about what society should be like, right? It's only worth having a class of people to reflect on that if you have a very large society, right? Because the benefits of that are multiplied by the number of people in the world, right? Whereas the costs of it are, um, you know, just fixed, basically, right? So the, as we've come to be a larger and richer society, we have um, more value from having a class of people whose job it is to spend their lives reflecting on these questions, right? Um, and to think about how to improve them, right? And to me, that's a pretty exciting class of people to be part of. Because to me, the types of questions we've been asking in this course are sort of writ large across the face of history, right? The questions that I was asking at this hedge fund were, how do I make money for my boss? How do I uh, you know, arbitrage this market? How do I solve some uh, little problem which is set to me by what's going to make money in the market? When I think about economics, I think about how do we reorganize the way that our society works so that things function better, so that we can get more to the poor, and that, so we can uh, you know, make the world grow and develop as a society. And to me, those are questions that people have been thinking about for thousands of years, and that people will continue to think about for the rest of the time that you know, mankind uh, exists in the world. And you know, perhaps the ideas that we come up with as economists will never change policy, right? But one thing that I find is that most people out there in the world think they know how to make the world a better place. They think they know what policies would be better. We should just cut taxes. We should just do this. We should just send money to people in poor countries or stop sending money to people in poor countries, right? Um, but they have so little time to actually think through whether that's right or not. Um, that they're much more confident than I think you, you could justify. And um, I get a lot of pleasure, even if I don't get to actually change anything in the world, just seeing how the world could be better. In my mind, I can see a way that could actually make the world work better. And the aesthetic pleasure that comes from that uh, is the most rewarding uh, part of my job, I think. And the truth is, that um, the truth is that if you, um, everyone sees the way that economists maybe don't have as much influence on policy decisions as they might think that they should have. But at the, at the same time, what does have an influence on what policymakers do? Well, some informal, maybe Keynesian logic from 50 or 60 years ago, right? Where did those policymakers learn that logic? From their econ textbooks. And who wrote those econ textbooks? The last generations of economists, right? John Maynard Keynes once famously said that, um, you know, people don't think economic ideas influence the way the world works, but in fact, there's hardly anything that has as much influence. Because when you go out on the street and you see the practical man who just thinks he's doing what is practical and he doesn't care about abstract ideas or whatever, is almost certainly applying something that he learned in his textbooks. Uh, because that's what seems practical to him. And the madman who has all these great ideas that he's going to change the world and you know, is a populist and whatever, he's almost certainly channeling the ideas of some economic thinker that he you know, read in some obscure thing, right? They filtered through uh, many generations of these. If you went back to Greece in 400 BC and you asked people what was the most important thing going on there, they would have said to you, oh, well, you know, there's this war with Sparta that Athens is waging and, you know, this diplomat has negotiated this great peace and Pericles has done this, this, and that. And in the end, maybe some people know who Pericles is, but all those other guys have been completely forgotten. 
But if you ask them, well, what about this guy in the market who's going around asking people questions or you know, talking about, um, talking about uh, you know, what's the meaning of the soul and what's the, uh, you know, what is truth and what is, uh, how should we organize society? People just said, oh, that's some crazy guy. We always have different crazy guys out there talking about stuff. If you'd gone to Palestine in zero AD, you know, uh, AD, right, you would have said, uh, you know, and you asked someone what's most important, they said, oh, well, you know, Augustus Caesar just visited us, right? And it was so great to have him around. And, you know, and there's this great trade route that's opened up where, with wherever. And you said, well, what about these people who are talking about salvation and, you know, in the square? And they say, oh, that doesn't matter, right? Um, and yet those are the things that actually shape the future of civilization, right? So I hope you guys will, you know, take seriously the idea of devoting your lives to thinking about the questions that I think in the long run shape uh, what, what we um, as a society uh, are like and um, that are questions that people have been thinking about for thousands of years and will keep thinking about for thousands of years. So thank you. It's been great having you in the class.